I'm Alex Steele. Welcome to Bloomberg Commodities Edge. We look at the companies, the physical assets, the trading behind the hottest commodities with the smartest voices in the business. Let's get right to the data dig where we take a look at some of the top stories of the week. So first up, that GameStop Reddit mania, well, that is most definitely spilling over into silver. Here's what happened. Late Wednesday, the subreddit chat room Wall Street Bets commented on the iShares Silver Trust, calling it the biggest short squeeze in the world, saying that banks are manipulating prices. Can you guess what happened next? Everything from silver prices to the ETF, the silver stocks rallied really hard. And talk about rallying hard, let's not forget about corn, the biggest gain since 2013. That happened on Tuesday after China made its largest one-day purchase from the U.S. since July. Now, ADM says that buying spree, definitely not over. They see China has a rampant appetite for crop imports that could last several years. And finally, Renewables, for the first time, are the dominant power source in Europe's electric grid. So renewables produce about 38% of the EU's electricity in 2020, up from 34% in 2019. And that was just enough to surpass the fossil power generation for the first time, which dropped to 37%. That report adds to data that showed last year was also the greenest ever for British power generation. This week, staying with green, President Biden signed a series of executive actions aimed at combating climate change. And the orders range from suspending leases on federal land for oil and gas drilling to directing federal agencies to buy electric vehicles. Joining me now is Bloomberg Opinion columnist Liam Denning. Hey, Liam, what was your biggest takeaway from the, from the plan? Well, I think, Alex, you know, one way to think about it is there's, there's, there's two ways to foster an energy transition. You know, one is to encourage new forms of energy, and the other is to discourage the old ones. Uh, in Biden's EOs, uh, there is a little of the encouragement kind of things. You know, you mentioned procurement of electric vehicles for federal fleets and that sort of thing. But to be honest, most of that is going to be on the legislative, the legislative side um, in terms of stimulus spending. Most of the EOs are really on the discouraging side, blocking Keystone XL, suspending leasing and temporarily permitting on federal lands for, for drilling. So. I see these EOs as really a way of, you know, injecting some uncertainty, raising the cost of capital, mm -hmm. delaying things for the oil and gas business uh, as, as a way of, of, of kind of discouraging those forms of energy. Well, that's such a good point. And the cost of capital really is key. Um, the companies in the crosshairs, like an EOG, um, Occidental comes up quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. They have a lot of land in federal areas. The theory is that it's okay, they got, they got enough permits for the next two years, it'll be totally fine by then. What's going to be the reality for these guys? I think the two-year point is fine as far as it goes. That's, it's true, mechanically, they do have uh, two years. The problem is these businesses uh, have to think a bit further than that, and capital markets certainly do think a bit further than that. So for the industry as a whole, uh, thinking about the next two years is fine, but we need, to, we need to kind of put this in the bigger context. We've just come off a decade, the 2010s, where we saw the shale boom. And what characterized that? Rising oil demand, low cost of capital, and, and, and just a, a vision that, that the US was emerging as an oil superpower. You look at the 2020s now, it's totally different. There's a government in place that is trying to curb activity. Uh, the cost of capital is already high and rising. It's just a very different environment and the financial markets are going to react accordingly. All right, Liam, really appreciate the insight. Thank you very much, Bloomberg's Liam Denning. Time now for Commodity in Chief, where we talk to one executive in the commodity world. And this week, we hear from Barbara Berger, president of Chevron Technology Ventures. First, we take a look at Chevron's clean energy goals. Number one, lower carbon intensity, things like flaring and methane emissions. It also wants to increase renewable production and then develop new technologies. Now, five years ago, the big buzzword in technology was digitalization. Now it's carbon capture, where CO2 released during oil production is captured and then pumped back into rock, not the atmosphere. Now, that technology is used at Chevron's Gorgon project in Australia's Barrow Island and reduces 40 percent of emissions each year. That's as much as it would take to power 500,000 U.S. homes. Enter Chevron Technology Ventures, launched uh, in the 90s to invest in new technologies. And startups are key to that energy transition. CTV has invested all across the spectrum, from carbon engineering, that's focused on that carbon capture, to ChargePoint, 
EV charging stations, and Cerberus, which focuses on new ways to frack a well. Its latest future energy fund launched back in 2018 and commits an initial $100 million to technology that lowers oil and gas emissions, plus supports low-carbon value chains. Now, I sat down with Barbara Berger, president of Chevron Technology Ventures, and asked where the best opportunities were in today's buzzword, hydrogen. Hydrogen and the promise of hydrogen is not new, um, but you have seen an acceleration in the types of solutions that are being progressed, the uh, focus and the money going in. But if we step back, so what's the promise of hydrogen? Um, it, could, it can be a fuel. Uh, it can be an energy storage and it can be an energy source. So you could see it being used in transportation, which is probably what people think about, but you could also see it being used in um, some of the industrial sector, steel production, things like that, and also for energy storage. When I talk to any oil company now, they all talk about hydrogen, but I never get a real sense that anyone really knows what to do about it. Um, and I'd love to get your take on the opportunities that you're seeing. The main way that, that hydrogen is made is with um, steam methane reforming, but it's a very en energy intensive process. And so it's, it's, it, we need to uh, lower the emissions on that production. Um, if we do that through renewable sources and so forth, it's still too expensive. So we need to try to lower the cost of that. So then once you produce hydrogen, is how do you transmit it and then, and then um, actually put it into use. And transmission, it's a gas, it's a very lightweight gas. Um, and so you can have pipelines, but, uh, or you can condense it. And then at the very end, if you're gonna use it, for instance, in transportation, you've got the whole infrastructure and just think about the gasoline infrastructure that we've had and you need to make that in hydrogen infrastructure. What kind of technologies are useful that you've seen in all three of those areas. So scaling carbon capture in concert with hydrogen production, uh, lowering the cost of electrolysis and incorporating renewables will get you a green hydrogen and also low carbon, but trying to lower the cost. So those, those are all there. In the, the distribution and the infrastructure, you know, we were working on that 13 years ago, I think in Chevron, um, you may have heard something called the hydrogen highway where, where um, we partnered with the Department of Energy just to look at what it does it take for the infrastructure to be built out. And you know, small amounts, uh, small number of stations in California to really prove that it can be done. So it's not, it's not a technical challenge, it's more of a scaling challenge. When do we reach scalability? Like is it a 2075? Is it 2050? Like, I know that there's so many variables, but when you're thinking about it, where do you see it going and how quickly? So it's going to happen in multiple levels, right? Um, you know, think about renewable energy, you know, renewable power generation. You know, that, that, that has scaled. Um, mm -hmm. We continue to see, um, whereas there's some tough problems uh, relative to hydrogen where um, you know, it's still some of the various technologies are not ready to scale. So I don't think it's going to happen like with the flip of a light switch. Um, and energy transitions really never do that. It is going to evolve over time and um, it's going to require different solutions and they're all on their own timetable. Since our taping, CTV announced a Series C investment in Blue Planet. That's a carbon capture and utilization startup. All right, time now for our commodity kicker. C is for cookie. In some cases, it's a gem gift fit for a cookie monster. Geologists and Sesame Street enthusiasts alike are drooling over footage of an unusual geode that resembles the cookie devouring Muppet after it was first revealed online earlier this month. The rock was originally found in Brazil, and it now belongs to gemologist Mike Bowers, who says collectors have offered him up to 10,000 bucks for the geode. That's a lot of dough but maybe it's worth it if you can get some friends to chip in. That does it for Bloomberg Commodities Edge. Make sure to catch us each Thursday, 1 p.m. New York time, 6 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg.